Hello. So here we are now. We're going to do uh, start our studies on the Apostle Peter's life. Peter, his name was Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter. Now we will go over that. I think the first section I'm going to work on is the his life from the beginning of his calling by Jesus up until the crucifixion of Jesus. And then we'll do another step from then on to the uh, end of the Acts of the Apostles. And then maybe another step to cover his epistles. Peter is a very important in this study because we are studying Simon or Simeon. So because Peter's name was Simon and because of another Simon that becomes involved later, which we will look at, um, this fits very nicely into our study. So now, before we get into this, we haven't covered much of the New Testament. So I'll, for those who don't um, know much about it, I'll just explain that uh, the New Testament begins with the four Gospels. And what the four Gospels are is uh, four people who knew Jesus or who lived very shortly after the time of Jesus who knew the stories very well and gathered the stories together. Um, each gospel is the story of the life of Jesus from that author's perspective. Uh, Matthew and Mark and John were all apostles. Um, but Luke was uh, commissioned to by uh, another person to write the history of um, Jesus and the apostles. And he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels were already out uh, in the first century. And after those three Gospels were out, as tradition tells us, um, the Apostle John, what, he lived um, into a, an old age, and he read the three Gospels, and he is quoted to have said that everything is true in those Gospels, but there's something missing. And so he wrote his Gospel as a, as a way of filling in the blanks for what the other Gospels had missed. And uh, the uh, Gospel of John is quite different than the other three. Uh, the, his Gospel more focuses on the love that he had for Jesus more than on what he actually did, but he gets into the deeper meaning of the love of Jesus. Um, so some people um, like that gospel much better. Um, they all are very valuable. So I'm going to begin this study of um, Peter with the gospel of John. Just because it works out better. So he's sort of filling in some information for us. And then we'll jump over to the other gospels and try to put them all together uh, this is the way we have to look at the life of Jesus when we want to get right into the details because they all give a little piece of the story. Some of them give the same exact same story and some of them add a little bit of information. And sometimes they, they uh, will um, contradict each other in minor details. But we'll get into that later. We'll start our study in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 35 to 40. Um, he's talking, when he says John, he's talking about John the Baptist. 
Again the next day, after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means master or teacher, Where do you dwell? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelled. And they abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And the tenth hour is about 5 p.m. And one of the two, which heard John speak and followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Peter's brother Andrew was one of the two that were listening to John the Baptist and that went to follow Jesus and went to hang out with him for a day when they found out where he lives. So that's the part that is not in the other Gospels. So now let's take a look at the same story in Matthew chapter 4. Okay, in Matthew chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Okay. So that seems to contradict John somewhat, as if Andrew didn't know him. Now in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, you'll find that basically the same story as Matthew. But now we'll take another look in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. That's the Simon who ended up being called Peter. And he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, or Rabbi, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, They enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. But they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from now on you shall catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So that sends to be another story again. Uh... But it's just giving more details of the same story. So now we're going to get more of the story from John. And we'll see how this all fits together. If we go back to John chapter 1, where we left off in verse 40, and we'll carry on uh, from there. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now that's Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. 
And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So Cephas is Aramaic. It means a stone. And Peter, Petra, is Greek, which means a stone. When Jesus came in the book of Luke, where he comes to the sea and starts teaching from Peter's ship, that Peter already knew who he was. His brother Andrew had already met Jesus once, and he told him, this is the Messiah, here he comes. So Peter already had heard quite a bit about Jesus, and that's when they followed him straight away that they already wanted to become his disciples before he even asked them. Now, we also know that Peter had a mother-in-law. So Peter was married. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. And when Jesus came to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick with a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered to them. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and Anon they tell him of her. What does Anon? Anon is uh, an Anglo-Saxon word. It means immediately. So immediately they told him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. The book of Luke chapter 4, verse 38 and 39. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. She ministered unto them. She made them food and served them as they all met in the house. So let's go on to Mark chapter 5 from verse 21 to 43. And when Jesus passed over again by ship to the other side, much people gathered to him, and he was nigh unto the sea. He was beside the sea. And behold, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray you, come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and many people followed him and thronged him. There was a great crowd. They were all pushing in on him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. She said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said to her, 
daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain men which said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he suffered no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So Jesus would only allow Peter and James and John to come with him. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw the turmoil and them that wept and wailed greatly. Because whenever anyone died, they even paid people to uh, weep and wail out loud and and to make it a, a time of mourning and to let everyone know. And when he came in, he said to them, Why do you make this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. A damsel is a young girl, like a virgin girl. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he took the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi. And that is Chaldean. It means maiden, arise. Which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say to you, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given to her to eat. So let's take a look at that story in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him, and a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, and came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and, and, and immediately her issue of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throngs you and presses you, and you say, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, and she declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And while he yet spoke, there came one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, only believe and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, she sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. So I don't need to go through every single story to, in all of the Gospels, but that's a good one just to sort of see what the differences are. 
and how it's the same basic story in, in them. There are some stories that appear in all of the Gospels, and there are some that appear in only one, or some others only in two. It's sort of uh, a little bit like that. Now let's take a look at the part where Peter walks on water. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24 to 33. Starting in verse 24. But the ship was now in the middle of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter came down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they came into the ship, the wind stopped. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, you are the Son of God. So in, in this instance, Peter walks on the water. Um, Let's take a look at the same story in the book of Mark, chapter 6. Mark, chapter 6, starting in verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before to Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when the evening came, the ship was in the middle of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it, it had been a spirit, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind stopped, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Okay, the same story appears in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. Um, and, and it's basically the same story, but in that one, Peter is not walking on the water. And in John, chapter 6, it also gives a very brief description. Before we get to uh, the next part, we're going to take a quick look in the book of Exodus at a description of manna. Um, manna, well, I'm, I don't have to explain to you what it was. I'll just read it to you so you know what manna is because they talk about manna in the next part. Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 15. Okay, so the people were complaining about being hungry. And in Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse 12, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass at evening, the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. 
And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. An omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it out with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They, gad, they gathered every man according to his eating. So some gathered a lot and some gathered a little, and then they put it all together and they measured an omer. I'm not sure how big an omer is. It's a measuring cup of some kind. Uh, they had just enough for every person. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun got hot, it melted. And it came to pass on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said to them, This is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and see that which you will seethe, and that which remains over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms in it. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the fields. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So that's manna. It's the bread from heaven. Um, it stopped before they got into the promised land in ancient times. But there was a legendary thing that, that the Jews all knew about. So now let's take a look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, starting in verse 22. Okay, this is a bit of a long one, but it's a good lesson. And it has a lot to do with Peter. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea, so this is right after he walked on water, and he went to the other side. And him and his disciples went to the other side of the sea. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except the one where his disciples entered, and that Jesus did not go with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, close to the place where they did eat bread, after the Lord had given thanks. Because um, he had just, before they went onto the sea, Jesus had just done the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And so now the crowds were all looking for where did he go? They wanted to follow him. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took ships and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And he answered them and said, Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for him has God the Father sealed. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? 
And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. They said therefore to him, What sign do you show us then that we may see and believe you? What do you work? I mean, they've already seen. Yeah, so. <laughs> Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So it's like you gave us real bread. Uh, our fathers had more of a miracle than that. So you're going to have to show us a bigger miracle for us to believe, is what they're saying. Then Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So he's saying that the manna was symbolic of Jesus, and now the true bread of heaven is here, the, the, the actual reality and not the symbol. And when they said to him, Lord, give us this bread forever. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you also have seen me and do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no way cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should rise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And what is the last day? The day of the resurrection, which is uh, the second coming of Christ, or related to that time at least. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that has heard and has learned of the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father, except he which is of God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that believes in me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of all the world. So now he's referring to his crucifixion. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, 
Not as your fathers ate manna and are dead, he that eats this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Does this offend you? It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So he's saying this is, this is a metaphor. It's symbolic. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I said to you that no man can come to me except it were given to him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. To who shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So it's his words that bring life. It's his eating his words is believing what he says. Because when you eat something, it goes into your stomach and it uh, gets turned into, nu into nutrients. And those nutrients go through your blood system and build up your flesh. They become a part of you. So Jesus, when you listen to his words and you actually digest what he's saying and you make it a part of your spirit and a part of your heart and your life, that builds you up spiritually. And that's what he means by eating my flesh and drinking my blood. His um, flesh and blood that's his sacrifice. So believing that he died on the cross and was risen from the dead is all part of eating the spiritual meat that he provided. Okay, now we'll take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 to 20. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Okay, so what is the tradition of the elders? We talked about the tradition of the elders already. Uh, when I talked about the Babylonian Talmud, and they also had the Jerusalem Talmud. And um, these are the writings of the rabbis who were um, explaining how to keep the law of Moses once after the temple was destroyed. Or they were explaining how to keep the law of Moses with the new temple that was built but say things like the ark of the covenant was gone um, i think the temple furnishings were taken uh, if i'm not mistaken by by the babylonian king so they had um, to adapt and they had to um, because the, the, the political realities around them had changed and they were constantly trying to figure out how to please God 
with the situation they were in. So, and then there, there became a tradition of the rabbis where each rabbi um, or chief rabbi was a great teacher and left writings. So these writings were piling up and piling up and, and they still have these huge books and volumes of books um, that are the teachings of the rabbis who are teaching the Torah. And um, by then, the traditions of the elders, they had uh, very specific ritualistic ways of washing your hands and, and the belief that if you did not wash your hands, your food would be defiled by, your, by touching it. Your, your hands had to be cleansed in a very specific way and at very specific times um, before you even eat. And so the Jesus and his disciples were not doing this. So this was the question. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And as we know, that's one of the Ten Commandments. And he that curses his father or mother, let him die the death. And you will also find that in the laws of Moses. But you say, whoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatever you might be profited by me. And honor not his father or, or his mother, he shall be free. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions. So obviously, I'm no, I'm no expert on the Jewish uh, Mishnah or, or Talmud writings, but obviously there are some writings in there that say this, that uh, whoever says to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatever you might be profited. So anything I give, anything from me that benefits my father or mother is a gift from God. So if the, if, the, if the traditions say that, then Jesus say, is saying, you make it impossible for a man to honor his father or his mother because anything you give them is a gift from God. And in this way, you have made the commandment of God, honor your father and your mother, of no effect by your traditions. You hypocrites, Isaiah did well prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. So, Jesus is just pointing out how, you know, their traditions have somewhat departed from God's ways. And um, they can't uh, come to him demanding that he follow these traditions when the tr traditions are not the ways of God. And he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand. It's not that which goes into your mouth that defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, that defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both 
shall fall into a ditch. The disciples were very concerned because if the Pharisees are offended at you, you could die. Then answered Peter and said to him, Declare to us this parable. He just said, it, is, it isn't what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It is what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. And this is what Peter is asking. Declare to us this parable. What does it mean? And Jesus said, Are you also yet without understanding? Do not you yet understand that whatever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draft, but into the sewer? <laughs> but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. And they defile the man, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat without washed hands does not defile a man. And this also goes back to his symbolic references about eating his flesh. It's, it's, it's symbolic and it's spiritual. So it's not the, the actual physical things that go into your mouth. It's the spiritual things that come out of your mouth that defile you. Having said that, I think it's time to end part four. And we will carry on in the next video with the life of Peter in part five. I'll see you then.